Year one of Matt Rule is in the books. Today we're looking at the... The good. The bad. The ugly. Hey, what's up? My name is Logan Merrick, and this is Husker Central. I created this channel just for you, who those who are fans of the Huskers, Husker football to be uh, precise, where we can commiserate and celebrate together. I dive into all different types of things. But today, I want to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of year one of Matt Rule. There were some good things, there were some bad things, and there were some very, very ugly things. Let's get going. All right, so the good. We're going to start there. I think right off the bat, player development is 100% right in Matt Rule's wheelhouse. We have not seen that over the years with the Scott Frost era. Mike Riley, not really, but especially in the Scott Frost era, we did not see player development. But now we are starting to see it. We are seeing players, freshmen, true freshmen, getting time, everyone's getting to practice. It's always next man up, and it's really good. How we see player development really play out in the offensive line. Now, I can already hear many saying it because you guys say it in the comments, my comments all the time. You tweet at me, those different types of things. The offensive line isn't that good. Donovan Ryle needs to be fired, da 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 da, da. Not so fast. I went out and looked at the PFF grades because I was going, all right, with my eye, offensive line looks better. Are they world beaters? No. Are they have they gotten better? Yes. And PFF grades, what are PFF grades? Well, they're grades and I'm going to actually have another video coming out later this week explaining PFF and looking at all the different skill set positions and how they graded out for the year. So that'll be coming up uh throughout the coming weeks. Um but let's look at each individual player and how they graded out for this year and years previous. All right, so first and foremost, you've got Ethan Piper now, Ethan got hurt, and I don't remember what game he got hurt, but later on in the season, so not a full season, but he got better. And if you can see, from 2019, 2020 was not good to him, but from last year to this year, he grades out a point and a half better than he did last year, and he grades out way better um, since Donovan Riola has taken over. He grades out way better um, than that. So then let's look at Bryce Benhart. Bryce Benhart is without a doubt, the best offensive lineman we have. Um, he grades out very high, as you're about to see. And Bryce Benhart has come a long way because I used to be very hard on that guy uh, when I would watch him. And so Bryce Benhart, here's Bryce Benhart's right here. His overall offensive grade is almost a 70, which is really good. These go from zero to 100. Uh, but you're going to find that above average is going to be in that 60 range. And then especially like you start getting in the plus eighties, that's like fantastic, but you're rarely going to see that, um, especially on a full season, but he grades out at almost a 70. I would give that a 70. His pass blocking is 67.1 and his run blocking, uh, almost 69. He got better from since like, again, let's look at Donovan Rayola, 2022, 2023, those are good grades. Then you've got 2021 20, and 2020, not so great. 2019, he didn't play a whole lot. So he's gonna, it's going to he's gonna grade higher when you don't have as many snaps, as long as you don't just completely blow it. So Bryce Benhart grading out very high. So we're looking at Donovan Raiola, isn't as bad as we thought. And the reason why it looked worse, well, I'll get into that in just a minute. Let's go on to uh Newelli. All right, so Newelli in 2021 to 2022. Now again. Donovan Rayola came in in 2021. Those are better grades than 2019. So I want to point that out. In 2020, he was in trouble, so he didn't get to play. Um, his offensive grade uh, overall is a 63.2. His pass blocking is very high. It's very good. His run blocking, pretty good. Not, not terrible, not great. It's pretty average. All right, let's look at Ben Scott, the transfer from Arizona in his first year. Now, Ben Scott had a fantastic year in 2021. Um, he was in Arizona, so that doesn't count. So let's look at this year. And he grades out about three points better than he did last his last year in Arizona. His overall score is a 64.1, and his pass blocking grade is uh, really good at a 70.7, almost a 71, and his run blocking is 62.4. 
these grades are speaking for themselves. Now let's look at Teddy Prohaska, somebody who I'm very, very hard on, and, and the one after him, Turner Corcoran, who didn't finish out the year because he got hurt, uh, their grades. All right, so here's Teddy Prohaska. His total, total overall grade is 66.3. Pass blocking is much better than actually I thought it would be because I thought he has been pretty bad. Uh, this year, but it, it looks like he's done pretty well. I want you to look from 2022 to 2023, the leap he made. Now, granted, he has not played a full season, so these are kind of shrunk down, but we still can get those grades put in. Overall, 66.3. Now, here's what I'm going to say about uh, Teddy Prohaska. He's six foot 10, and if you're fast, a fast edge rusher, you can get around him every time. He is slow left and right, but he's very, very strong. So those bull rushers don't do as well, but if you're a speed rusher, he struggles. But still, good grade. And we see them all, all of them better, even if it's just one point better or whatever. They're still grading out better than they did the year before. Again, development. All right, let's look at Turner Corcoran. Turner Corcoran is without a doubt the worst offensive lineman we have. Again, did not finish out the year. His overall grade is not good. Um, it is a 50 3.9, so almost 54. Pass blocking, look at that. That is poor. 37.5, and then his run blocking, 60, almost, basically 61. Last year, not good. We know that. We can look at we, we can look at last year's tape, and he was not really bad. This year, much better, about 20 points better, uh, but still not great. But again, he got hurt, and then Teddy Prohaska comes in. Either way. Either way, offensive line, just from the data points. And again, I'll have a video coming out here uh, this week to talk about how uh, Pro Football Focus comes up with their grades and all of that kind of stuff so you can understand how they come about. And we'll even have some, uh, some videos so you can kind of see how they go about grading those. But from an offensive line perspective, Donna Varela is not as bad as many of you think he is. He's, much better, he's a much better coach than you thought. The offensive line, much improved. Pass blocking, especially. But you can say, well, but Logan, I mean, they were leaking like a sieve. Da, da, da. No. What happens is all three quarterbacks get antsy. They don't get settled in the pocket. They're not good pocket passers. They're just not. All three of them. And so when you have a, when you have a quarterback who's antsy and will dance outside the pocket, he creates the sacks himself most of the time. So. Let's also look at another player. Two other players to show that player development much, much better. Nash Hutmacher. Look at these grades, man. This is fantastic right here. His defensive overall grade, 70.1. Run defensive grade, almost a 70. Pass rush, 66, essentially. Coverage grade, I mean, come on, covering, you're a defensive tackle. So, a 61 and a half. Let's look at from, from last year to this year. Look at that. Look at the massive jump. 55 and a half last year to 70.1 this year. That's what Pot Roast, Terrence Knighton, the defensive line coach, has done for this team. Look at that. I mean, the proof is in the pudding right there, baby. Let's look at one other one. My other favorite player on defensive line, Prince Will, true freshman. Now, he's only been here one year, but I want you to look at this grade. It's almost a 70, 69.8. Run defense, 66. Coverage grade, because he plays that jack position, 70.3. Pass rush, almost a 70. This guy is going to be a stud. Mark my words. These are fantastic grades. He's going to be a stud. Remember what I said. If you get up in the 80s, it's... It's unbelievable. That goes from green to blue, and so it's a very, 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 ex it's excellent. And he's only a true freshman. Incredible. And so I look at it and go, offensive line, check, great. Freshman, good. Defensive line, I don't want to go into everybody's, and so they, they all did well. Cam Lynn Hart, uh, Riley Van Poppel. They all played really well. Let's go to another one that this one right here, you're all going to go, well, yeah, that makes sense. But I don't think you guys realize how big this one is. Jalen Lloyd. This is from an article from the Omaha World Herald. 
Freshman receiver Jalen Lloyd had 66-yard touchdown catch in the second quarter of, of the Iowa game. It marked Lloyd's third touchdown catch at least 58 yards this season. That's huge. There's only one other player to do that. He joins Ohio State's Marvin Harrison Jr. as the only Big Ten player three catches of at least 50 yards this season. Do you realize that Marvin Harrison Jr. is the top-rated wide receiver in the NFL draft this year? Like, he could go number two overall. And Jalen Lloyd, who, by the way, this is only his second full year playing football? Dude, guy's going to be a stud. Going to be a stud. Lloyd caught a touchdown pass in consecutive weeks, marking the first Husker true freshman with a touchdown catch in consecutive games since tight end Matt Herion. I guess that's how you say his last name, in 2002. Dude, I was still in high school. I'm 39 years old. I was still in high school then. The 66-yard touchdown pass was the longest play against Iowa in 2023. As we know, Iowa does not give up the, the long pass. And Jalen Lloyd streaked it. Incredible. Just incredible. So right there, we've got wide receiver, defensive line, and then running back. Um, uh, Emmett Johnson, true freshman, coming in and did a terrific job. So all good things. Next man up mentality really played out well, I think, even though we got laced with injuries, laced with injuries. And that's so much of the excuses of why we lost games and this, that, and the other. Five and seven was our record. And everybody said, well, a lot of it. No. It, next man up, I was, I'm just impressed. I'm excited for next year. So that's the good. Let's move to the, on the offensive side. Let's move. Uh, well, I talked about some defense. Defense, top 15. By the way, our offense is going to be in that bad section. If you, I'm sure you know. Defense, top 15. We were number 14 overall. We had excellent coaching uh, all over that side. From Terrence Knight and uh, Potros to Evan Cooper, Rob Dvorak with the linebacker, um, Tony White, of course, leading the way uh, as the defensive coordinator. Excellent coaching. Development on the D-line, which I've already talked about. I showed you Nash Hutmacher's grades. Very, very high. Prince Will, also very high. Here's another one. Our penalties got better as the year went on. So it started pretty high. And went down. I don't know if you remember last year, penalties were outrageous. Got much better. We finished out the year with 61 total penalties for 513 total yards. Our opponents, 71 for 631 yards. So we always did better. We averaged better than our opponents. We got better as the year went on with, with it. Now, granted, there were some bad, and this goes at Teddy Prohaska. I just bragged about you a little bit some bad false starts and things like that at crucial, crucial times. That stuff has to be cleaned up. But all in all, penalties got better. Recruiting. Recruiting is the next thing. They have an eye for talent. Way before the big dogs, Ohio State's, the Alabamas, the Floridas, the Florida States, um, the Georgias, before they come calling, these guys are, are, are getting looking at talent and making offers long before those guys come in. Kewan Lacey is, is one that we had committed and decommitted to go to Alabama. It is what it is. My point being, these guys know talent, and they're going after athletes. They're going after athletes, and they're going, we can develop it. We can develop them. And again, going back to my first point, they've proven that they can develop. So there's that. Jalen Lloyd also kind of being that, going back to – Hey, somebody that they, this is his second year, second or third year, either way, in college, this is his first year, didn't really play in high school. They spotted that talent, went after him and got him. Incredible. All right, so that's the good. Let's look at the bad. Offense, I told you we had a top 15, number 14 overall defense. Offensively, 117th. We led the nation in turnovers. Now, this I looked when I got when I got this statistic, my mind was blown. I knew we led the nation in turnovers. We had 31 fumbles. 31. We lost 15 of those. So 16 fumbles.
we actually got got retrieved back, but we had 31 total and 15 lost. 16 interceptions, so 31 total turnovers in a game or for the season. You cannot win. You cannot win like that. You, you can have the number 14th team in the nation. Iowa is a perfect example of a team that has a, an offense worse than ours statistically. And they still win. They went 10-2. and two. Why? They don't turn the ball over. You cannot win with turnovers. Matt Rule has to get that fix. He knows he has to get that fix, and they better do it quick because the main primary one, quarterback. Got to go in the got to go in the portal. Now, granted, Chubba Purdy, by the way, looking at his PFF grades, graded way higher than uh, Heinrich Harburg and Jeff Sims. We're going to get to Jeff Sims in just a few minutes. We are 125th out of 133 teams. Not not good. We averaged, listen to this, we averaged 18 points per game. Our opponents, 18.3 per game. Sound familiar? How many games did we lose with three-point margin? And, and you can't put it all on the defense's shoulders because they've done a great job. Now, granted, they folded at the worst times. When you needed them to stiffen the most, they folded. But the offense always put them in bad predicaments. Had them out on the field a lot. Special teams. Special teams coverage. The coverage got better than it has been in, the, in years past. But the punting, not good. Very hot and cold. Brian Buschini, there would be days he was booting them. And then there were days that you're going, what in the world was that? My nine-year-old can punt farther than that. Kicking never came through in clutch times. Tristan Alvano, I think, will be a good kicker. He's got a big leg, but man, got to come through in clutch times, and it never, ever did. That last game, he kicked one clear out to Grand, Grand Island. Like I, I don't know where that ball, it wasn't even in the same zip code. It was so far left. All right, so that's the bad. The bad is the things that I go, I think it will get better for the most part. But then we get to the ugly. I mean, the absolute ugly that does make me go, well, some of this, the bad, I don't, I'm not sure. Clock management. That falls squarely on the shoulders of Matt Rule. You are the CEO, and you guys were atrocious at clock management. And I don't know, I don't know if this is like just because I watched the Ohio State Michigan game and I saw bad clock management with Ohio State. Like I'm seeing it all over. It's like our coach is not paying attention to the clock. Do they get so invested? Like I don't know. But either way. Clock management has to happen, and, and it goes into wasted timeouts. In that last game against Iowa, they were going to go for it on fourth or kick a field goal, fake, but they were going to fake the field goal. I don't know if that means they're going to pooch, pooch punt it, make it look like a field goal, and just kind of pooch it. I'm not sure. Nobody's going to go for an actual field goal with 60 yards with the, a 60-yard field goal with the wind blaring. Like It's just not going to happen. But we had wasted timeouts all the time. Why? Play calling took forever to get in. Forever. Which brings me to another point. We were always huddling with less than two minutes. We would have no timeouts because you wasted them all. And we had no sort of hurry up offense. Always huddling, draining the clock. And ultimately what would happen? Everyone's rushing around. Some guys don't even know what the play call is and we throw interceptions, or we fumble. Why? Because you're not getting play calls in. You've not practiced it enough, apparently, and you've decided to not practice no huddle situations. I'm not sure what is going on with that, but, man, it would drive me crazy. Next thing. I don't have to tell you guys. There's a guy on here for ugly. Marcus Satterfield. The play calling, no consistency. You'd have Emmett Johnson, great run, gash him, 8, 9, 10, 12 yards. 
and then he'd be gone. And then we would throw the ball three straight times. It was clunky. It never felt like they had really any real play play call or uh, play plan. It felt like they were literally just like covering their eyes and just pointing to a play on their play sheet and going with that. They never played to the to the strength of the players. Because it goes back. So this goes back to true freshmen, people getting hurt, true freshmen having to step up. I know that there's growing pains, but it never felt like you played to the strength of your team. Granted, offensive line, great at pass blocking. But you didn't have a great, for, for the majority of the season, didn't have a great pure passer. And Heinrich Harburg, terrible. He led, by the way, um, he had he led with in passing 960 yards, and then he was also led as the rusher for 500 and something yards, which is the first time uh, in, a, in a long time, I, and I should have had that stat uh, written down, but I didn't. But this, it's the, one, the third team in college football history to not have a thousand yard passer uh and a and a thousand yard rusher like for somebody not to have one of the like it's it's insane i don't, I, I wish i would have kept that one and then we would just have bad coaching in critical situations just dumb dumb play calling i go back uh to maryland i go back to wisconsin throw in the ball uh, in Iowa, in the middle of the field, you've got you don't have any timeouts left. You should be throwing to the perimeter. Instead, you're throwing to the middle of the field when you've got no timeouts and you got to make up a lot of time and you only have 20 seconds left. You're throwing to the middle of the field, let alone the interception and 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 the risk you take. But you just don't have time for that, and not to get your field goal unit out. It just doesn't make any sense. And then, last but not least, of the ugly, Jeff Sims. I don't know how in the world they thought he was the next Lamar Jackson, but I want to show you something here. Jeff Sims, this is actually Jeff Sims' worst year statistically ever. Ever. We already knew he was turnover prone, but I want you to look at this right here. Look at where I've circled this. Look at his PFF grades. From 2020, it was a 57. In 2021, it was a 69 overall, which is pretty good. 62, 37. Passing, 34. Running, 54, essentially. He was way better running the ball in years prior at Georgia Tech than he was here. And it's not even close. Passing-wise, he was better he was better at Georgia Tech where they don't have great receivers and they don't anyway. His first year was a 48. He didn't even make it a 50% or a 50. 34 in 2023 with Nebraska. Bad stuff all the way around. And so what does that tell you? I don't I don't know what it was that Marcus Satterfield and Matt Rule was looking at because he wasn't great. He wasn't great at Georgia Tech, but I don't know what in the heck happened. And I think so much of it falls on play calling and coaching because our offensive coordinator is also our quarterback's coach. And that was the worst position on the field by a long shot. So I put that at the feet of Matt Rule and Marcus Satterfield. But there's only the opinions. There's my opinion. There's your opinion as the fan as well. And then there's the players' opinions, who I think matters the most. So before I give you my overall grade and finish out this video, let me show you these tweets that went out. This is Jameer Butler and Vincent Carroll Jackson. Vincent Carroll Jackson says, because uh, this says uh, Matt Rule's year one anniversary with the Huskers is today. This was... Um, Yesterday um, or Saturday, Vincent Carroll Jackson said, be excited for what is to come because he's just getting started. And Jamiri Butler, if you'll remember, went into the transfer portal and came back out because Matt Rule 
and Tony White believed that they could do something with him, and he had a great year. It may not show up statistically, but there are some things that he did on the field that were incredible. I'm going to get – again, I'll be going into the defensive line and the PFF grades and all that stuff in the coming videos, offensive line, corners, linebackers, all that stuff. Those will be future videos. Jameer Butler says 10 out of 10, wouldn't trade it for nothing. I think that I think that matters the most. So that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let me know what you think in the comments. Did I miss anything? What What is it that you think was good, bad, and ugly that I may not have mentioned? I want to know. If you would, would you like this video? If you got some stuff out of it, would you share it with, uh, with some others? If you haven't subscribed, would you consider subscribing? Because, again, this is for you who are fans like me who just love the Huskers and want to talk about it or you want to commiserate and celebrate our Huskers. A lot coming up with the transfer uh, transfer portal uh, opening up December 4th. There's already been some uh, quarterbacks enter. Uh, I'll be talking about several of those. Overall grade, C+. Plus. C+. Plus. I think, I think that the defense showed us enough. I think the offensive line showed us enough growth, and I think the wide receivers and running back uh, – positions and the youngsters showing up give us enough hope to go okay it's average it's average right now but it's going to be something great and i truly truly believe that with that being said thanks so much for watching this video like i said if you would subscribe if you haven't subscribed already like this video if you got something out of it let me know your overall grades in the comments below and i will see you next time right here at husker central bye-bye how can i almost forget Last thing, go Big Red!